Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview with the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are actress, filmmaker, Julie Davis, and director, actor, John Plachette. Julie Davis was raised in Miami, a graduate of Dartmouth, attended the AFI Film School, is a writer, director, actress, editor, producer, wife, and mother. <laughs> wow. You've done it all, right? Yes. <laughs> That's very overwhelming just hearing that. <laughs> you've, seen her, you've seen her on the screen. Um, you've seen her credits as a filmmaker and writer of I Love You, Don't Touch Me, All Over the Guy, Amy's Orgasm, and finally, Finding Bliss. Um, why did you go to New York um, to start working? Well, I didn't go to New York. I never, I actually never went to New York. I came right out here. You came right to LA? Yeah, did to you go to York. AFI right away? Yeah. No, I didn't go to, I went to AFI a year after I moved out to LA. I moved out to LA right from college. But you know, the, the New York Times has dubbed you the female Woody Allen. Right, they did that at Sundance when my first film, uh, I Love You, Don't Touch Me. So I keep there. thinking you're like a New Yorker because everyone of that. Does. Do no, they? Everyone does. I don't know why. No, and no New York. I don't think I've been in New York for more than three days at a time. I don't like New York. I know people hate me for saying that. I just, I've always had bad experiences there. I'm always almost mugged. I just <laughs> broke down the street in broad daylight. I've had horrible things happen to me. I've, I've just have, every time I go there's something bad happens. That's really weird because of all this kind of uh, New York publicity about you. Um, what did you do when you um, <coughs> did I Love You, Don't Touch Me? Did you write it, direct mm -hmm. it? I wrote it, directed it, edited it, produced it. I made it for $68,000, and I raised that money on my own. That was uh, quite a while ago. That was in 1997. But we're talking about the beginning. Yeah, that was the beginning. Uh, that was the beginning for me. I knew that I was never going to make it if I tried to do it within the system. Did you act in it too? I did not act in it. I really wanted to, but as my first film, and for such a low budget, I had so much on my shoulders that acting in it would have been really difficult. So my best <laughs> friend, my best friend played my part. So it was autobiographical? Yeah. And what was it all about? It was about uh, a hopeless romantic losing her virginity. This is really, this is good. We're going to follow this little line all the way through. Kind it's always of, about sex. Kind of sexy, yeah, right? Went from virginity to the porn business. That's sexy kind of Julie. <laughs> all over the guy. All Tell us about that. All over the guy. <coughs> all over the guy I directed. Um, I was a director for hire. And it's uh, wonderful. It's a gay romantic comedy. Oh. And um, stars had Christina Ricci's in it, Lisa Kudrow, Andrea Martin, Sasha Alexander, Adam Goldberg, uh, just uh, wonderful actors. And uh, that was great. When you came into it as the director, did you help cast it as well? I always do, yeah. That's one of the biggest parts. And then how long does it take to get that large uh, group of actors ready? Well, that was a, you know, everything I've done has been low budget. So that movie was only made for $600,000. Uh, Lisa Kudrow and Christina Ricci only worked on it for a day. Oh, so you brought them in like that? Yeah, they just worked for a day. And, yeah. did they, and were they friends of yours? Is that no, they, came they were actually friends of the one of the producers. Because isn't that the way to keep your budget low and to get some yes. names? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What about Amy's orgasm? Amy's orgasm was uh, my real huge labor of love because that is the one I acted in. I starred as Amy, and I felt at that point that I was ready to, you know, put myself in front of the camera. But at that point, everybody only knew of me and thought of me as a filmmaker. And when I said, well, I'm going to act and I'm going to play the lead, people just were very, very unsupportive. They said, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're the director. You can't do that. And, and you know, what if you're bad? 
but you're not pretty <laughs> enough. You're not pretty enough to play the lead. I had so many people say that. Are you kidding? And, uh, yeah, and they're like, you're going to ruin your own movie. So I was, um, you know, very, very scared. But I think I knew, you know, I had to do that one. That was the part that was perfect for me. It, it might never have happened again, and I knew that I had to do it. But when did you take acting classes? Well, I acted all in, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school, and college. So I, you wanted to be an actor? Yes, always. And then how did the filmmaking part come well, into it then? When I when I was at Dartmouth, I took some filmmaking classes, and I just loved, oh, loved did. making films. Because um, I'm a writer, and I love photography. And when I started editing at Dartmouth, I just loved editing. So I kind of, you know, I love every part that makes, you know, I love music, and all of that put together is filmmaking. That's what I was going to ask you on, the, on the, the last three films that we talked about. How did you choose the music? Well, the music was I either you know worked with composers, so it was original music. It was it was um, it was original music in all of them except I Love You Don't Touch Me. We didn't have enough money for a composer, <laughs> so we licensed songs. And but doesn't that sometimes cost more? Well, not when it's just a festival. We just had festival licenses, which I are see. cheap. And then once the movie sold, Samuel Goldwyn bought the movie at Sundance. That was my kind of fairy tale. And then once he picked up the film, then of course we had to go back and pay all the music. Uh, so what was five hundred dollars went up to thirty-five thousand. That's what I was wondering because it seems like then, but but at yeah. that point you couldn't bring a composer in. I didn't need to at that point because at that point everybody loved all the songs. So everything was good. And Goldwyn was willing to pay for all the songs, so. So that was perfect for you. Yeah. Then you got uh, um, to Bliss. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. That took a long time. That took a long time. That How took many a years decade. I feel like a decade. Um, I hadn't directed my my last film was when I was, God, it was like eight years ago. Amy oh, Zoe. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Amy's you've orgasm. Been yeah. Ever was, since that? No, I haven't acted after Amy's orgasm. I didn't act. You know, for I was just trying to get Finding Bliss made. I wrote it as a uh, pilot for Showtime. I sold it a couple times to different producers. I, it would fall apart, people would fall out, actors would fall out, and uh, it just took years and years and years, and I finally got it What financed. happens to you during that time? Are you writing? Mm -hmm. Are you, oh, you're writing mm -hmm. for, uh, are you under contract to? No, 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 I'm always writing on spec. I did a couple things for hire, and I was a producer for all those years. I mean, that really is what I did mostly was try to raise money. Just producing for your own film or for other people? No, just my own. Just your own, because that's a long time mm -hmm. to take to to do a film that did you write, mm -hmm. and so you believed in it, obviously. Mm -hmm. So you just kept plugging away. Yeah, I think. Uh, tell us the story, Finding Bliss. Well, Finding Bliss is a semi-autobiographical comedy based on my experiences when I first moved out to LA after uh, graduating Dartmouth, and the only job I could get <laughs> was editing porn. <laughs> So it's nice, nice Jewish girl moves out to LA to be a filmmaker. Ends up cutting hardcore porn. Her parents think she's working for Steven Spielberg as an intern on his new Holocaust film, but she's really, you know. Were you working in the Valley? Because we always think porn in the Valley. No, I was actually <laughs> working. I actually worked at Playboy in Beverly Hills. Oh, you did, above and the you were editing it there. Yes, yeah. on Beverly Boulevard. Mm -hmm. Is that right? So, um, I also read that you were. Uh, uh, debuting your porn star acting in Finding Bliss. Yeah, I don't know where that came from, but it's interesting. No, no, I'm We just better get rid of that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah but don't, do you play a porn star? No, I just have a cameo at the end is uh, porn star Diane Cannons. That was a great name. No, See, no. I think that's one of the reasons they wanted to play that up, right? It's uh, If you blink, you miss it. <laughs> it's me and Ron Jeremy and Mr. Marcus, who are two of the biggest male porn stars on each of my um, arms, but, walking into the big porn Academy oh, Awards. But you know those porn, porn stars. Yeah. Did you get them to come and do your film for you? Yeah. Well, Ron, Ron has done. I've done a bunch of stuff with him over the years, and he's you know he's in the film at the end, and then Mr. Marcus is actually plays one of the characters in the film, Jake B. Big. And he's wonderful. He's a real porn star, but he was he's wonderful in the movie. And he's just, just acting too. He really did a great job. I'm really excited for people to see. I'm, what I'm he excited did. to see it too. Especially so learning that you were editing those films yeah. all yeah. that time. Yeah. Well it's it's really a sweet romantic comedy. It's actually very in a way, very old fashioned. So it, it definitely has some off color humor. 
but it's, uh, it stars Louis Sobieski, uh, Matt Davis, Denise Richards, Jamie Kennedy, who plays a porn star, <laughs> Dick Harder, um, Dick Kristen Hart. Johnston from Third Rock from the Sun plays the president of the porn company. She's wonderful. I bet you have a real, really inside uh, knowledge about what's going on yeah. well, when you wrote this. I wanted to tell a story about the people who work behind the scenes in that yeah, business. And you were there. Yeah, and it's fascinating. All the people who want to do other things, who want to be the composer, who want to be a cinematographer, who want to be an editor, want to be a director, actor, and we're all working behind the scenes. To make you know, money. To yeah. get on to where you're going yeah. and we're like, next. What, what the hell are we doing with yeah. our life? Well, now, what are you doing with writer Henry Jaglum? <laughs> well, this is a nice twist of fate. Um, I got a call from Henry to come in audition for his play, his new original play, 45 Minutes from Broadway. And he had seen Amy's Orgasm, which has been playing on Showtime for eight years. <laughs> and God bless Showtime. <laughs> and he had seen it, and I guess there was something in the performance that made him think I could play the part of Betsy in his play. And when I got the call, uh -huh. I thought it was to come and direct the play. And uh, who's directing it? it? Gary Imhoff directed the play. Wonderful director. So Henry didn't direct his own play? No, he didn't. He did not. He, uh, he's producing it, and he wrote it. And so you were the perfect person. What is your person? What does Betsy do? Well, Betsy, the play is about a, a theater family um, who come from the Yiddish theater, generations of that, and I am the older daughter who oh. is kind of never fit into the family. I'm a businesswoman. I hate the whole artistic, creative side. Oh, yeah. I think they're they're self-indulgent, narcissistic people who have no sense of responsibility. And I am just the kind of serious and very angry and very damaged. Are you judging them all the time? I just, I want them to understand me and my point of view, <laughs> and they don't. So it's a, it's a play about family dynamics and wanting to be understood by your family when you feel like you just don't fit in. Have you been in any of Henry's films? No. Because his films are terrific, too. And how do you feel um, saying his words? Because oh, it's you've great. been writing your own words for yourself. It's, it's great. It's really, um, I want to act in other people's material, do other people's material, and it's just wonderful. And Gary Imhoff is directing. Yeah. Is his style anything like yours, or is it because he's on stage and you're Stage in film? and screen are so different, so different. Completely different process. Um, you know, I think in terms of what the camera sees. Right. And so I was always being told to be bigger, bigger, bigger. You're not acting for camera, you're acting for, you know, a theater. Are you um, teaching at all? Do no, you teach? I don't. You don't teach because you have so much to offer. Yeah. Well, someone would hire me. <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to <laughs> well, when, when um, you're on the stage and you have a younger sister in 45 Minutes from Broadway who mm -hmm. is? Tana Frederick. And, and is it an ensemble class? Are you all on stage at the same time? Yeah, all the it's time? A seven, seven characters. It's an ensemble. Tana Frederick plays my younger sister, Pandora, and she's the one who really fits in with the family, and they favor her, and I'm very jealous of her. And she's also my fiancé, who I come to introduce to my family, starts to fall for her. Oh, my gosh. So it, do you think Henry will make a film fr about this? I think or he will. Or from it? I hope he does. Everybody thinks it would be a great film. It's playing in Santa Monica at the Edgemar Center. Yes. And it's a wonderful cast. David Proval is in. He plays Uncle Larry. He was in The Sopranos, and he's just an amazing actor. Uh, we have Diane Salinger, Jack Heller. It's just a fantastic cast. It sounds like you're having a great time. I'm so happy <laughs> to not have to worry about the financial end oh, of producing <laughs> and, and all of that. You know, this is the only project I've ever worked on where, you know, I don't have to worry about the craft service, if the food's <laughs> going to get there on time, if the equipment's broken, if, you know, all that type of stuff. It's just great. So you're um, taking a vacation on the stage. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thanks for being uh, with us for this part of the show. We'll be right back with director John Plachette. <laughs> Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with director, actor, John Plachette, who was born and raised in New York City. 
he attended all the right schools dalton collegiate and brown where after graduating cum laude from brown he had a scholarship a fellowship to carnegie tech which is now carnegie mellon john worked for ten years in new york doing broadway off broadway films and lots of commercials in l a since the eighties he's been racking up all kinds of awards for his directing as well as his acting so what did you study at brown english yeah, that's not yeah. an acting school is it no no i mean uh, there were there was actually there were acting classes there were two were acting classes yeah that were <laughs> pretty good well they were pretty good actually it was a guy named james barnhill and he used to go he used to go into new york twice a week because he was a member of the actor's studio oh that was and cool and he came in and he taught you know gave us exercises and scene work and things oh, but so i did, did a lot of plays you did do them there yeah around? i did a lot of plays i mean there was you know it, it was extracurricular it was really almost like taking F a, a five course load because I went to rehearsals every night. Were you acting? Oh yeah, I did you Hamlet. Did. You, you know, my senior up? year, and and um, I mean, actually, I by the time I was a sophomore, I kind of knew that's just, this is what I wanted to be, and I kind of wondered whether I should be a college at all. So I I spoke to Barnhill, you know, and I said, you know. What am I wasting my time? It shouldn't yeah, I be in New York? Right. And he said, "Well, you know," he said, "You know, the odds of your making any, any sort of success as an actor is very slim. And what are you going to do if you don't? You know, if you fall on oh, your so face in five years, what are you going to have to?" And he right. said, "Also, he says you look very young." And I did when I was, you know, nineteen. I looked like I was thirteen. And he <laughs> said, "You know, you go to New York now. All you're going to do is be playing young teenagers." And he said, "If you stay here." He said, "You'll get to play some of the greatest roles around," Is and so I did right? because we basically, you know, we did the cla we did the, the classic. classics. So that's fantastic that a teacher would say that because yeah. he was in New York all the time, as you said, and and that was like part of his life. And yet he was giving you. I, I thought you were going to say, "Well, what are you going to do? I'm taking English. Well, what am I going to do after that?" instead of acting teach me no i mean taking or? english isn't very practical that's either but I mean. you know that's what, that's although you know 19 <laughs> when i graduated it was 64 it was not that hard to get into the job market i mean yeah. did you have show business in your family i had show business sort of indirectly cuz my my parents were very close friends most of their friends were in the arts my father was an oh. obstetrician <laughs> And a gynecologist, and uh, you know, a lot of his patients were. He had. I think he. I think most of the the members of the m ballet community the, were all patients of his. How and, great. and his best. One of his best friends was Zero Mostel. I grew up with Zero and oh, really? painted with him. And and uh, you know, they they were very close friends with all those blacklisted actors and um, writers yeah. and musicians and um, there were a lot of them in New York then at the time too because oh, yeah. there were a lot out here as well well a lot of them came <laughs> back to New York because they the one place they couldn't work was Hollywood I oh, mean zero so they, didn't work for 12 years oh, yeah, so, so yeah and and Suzanne Plachette she's a she was my cousin from your obviously your father's side. well actually yeah my father's side but uh, she's a she was a second cousin and she was sort of they were they were in Brooklyn we were in in Manhattan and I you know I sort of knew her from afar oh, but that didn't influence you oh it was, sure it did did it did it oh yeah because she was very successful and we used to go and she was successful early I mean she was successful right out of the neighborhood playhouse I think she got a job immediately oh, so. yeah so you went to Carnegie Tech but you left yeah I left went to Broadway yeah. I mean went to New York did yeah you, and you started working right away how'd you get work well, I just, you know, I started auditioning, and I got an off-Broadway show. I was, went back in November. I got an off-Broadway show in January. I was in that, and, you know, I think for six months. Then I went to, then I did Shakespeare in the Park, you know, then I got another show. And it, and it was, was also, great. well, you know, for the ten years that I was there, um, the off-Broadway scene was at least a very, very active scene. Mm. And it was possible to, you know, live in New York and study. I mean, I, you know, I studied acting and I took dance at. Uh, well, I was going to yeah. ask you, did you do I all took a, of that? Uh, yeah, I did all that stuff. You know, I had a <laughs> sort of voice teacher, you know, and all that stuff. And, but I was in a show where the first show I was in, I made 
$45 a week. And I made $5 more than anybody else in the cast because I was also the assistant stage manager, so they gave me a little extra you money. You had extra work. Were you living at home? No, I, I moved. Were, no, my, my parents finally kicked me out because I was, <laughs> I was, before I got work and I would like sleep till 1030 and my father finally said, you got to get out of here. So, oh, so I got out and then I got an apartment. I mean, I got a, you know, job. And then job. when you started getting your TV roles and recurring roles, were you there or were you in LA? No, no, I was, I, I mostly supported myself. I mean, I worked fairly steadily. I mean, I, you know, I did. You know, I did a, a lot of off-Broadway, a play called The Indian Wants the Bronx, which was on a double bill with, um, uh, with a play called, it's called The Sugar Plum. That was a two-character play with me and Marsha Mason. And the other cast was, was uh, Al Pacino and John Casale. And, uh, really? Yeah, yeah. So you guys were all working hard. Yeah, Maybe. we were all working hard. And it was a very, ex you know, it was a very exciting time. There was a we lot of... friends? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there was, it was not that huge a community of yeah, actors in New York. Wondered. And there were, you know, it, it's sort of, you were, I studied with, with Sandy Meisner, you know, then there were the group of people who studied with, with Strasburg at the studio, and then there were the, you know, the Stella Adler people. But we all met and did off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway, and, and it was a nice, it, also, you could live in New York for, you know, my I had an apartment. It was seventy-seven dollars a month. I think it sounds yeah. like that was a very exciting time. It was great. Be, to, it was really an great. And I think, but you know, unfortunately, what happened was that. I mean, I guess I guess the most telling example I could give is that the 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 first play I ever did in New York, I was making forty-five dollars a week, but the play was capitalized at fifteen thousand oh, dollars. When I so. by the time I left New York, which was seventy-five, the last off-Broadway show I did, I was making $73 a week, but the show was capitalized at 145000 oh, So, So the, 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 the money being spent on the production value of this, of this was completely disproportionate. It went. It just so it, changed. It, well, it sort of destroyed the whole idea of off-Broadway. Is off -Broadway. that it was? Do you think that's where it started Well, I think changing? there were two things. I think, first of all, there was less uh, there was less original plays being done on Broadway. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the time of the sort of the, all the Brits were coming in and, t and doing all these shows, or there were musicals, which I was n never really a musical comedy you performer. Know, you couldn't dance and sing, but you were Not taking really. singing Not really. I was taking, but I was hardly a gypsy, you know. When you, yeah. <laughs> when you, uh, you made a film here, Gentleman's Bronco. Yeah, yeah. Well, with Jared Hess. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Did you have him? him? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's a funny it guy. It's bizarre. He did Napoleon Dynamite. I know. I know. Well, well it was the most fun. It was the funniest experience because I, it was really just like I had two or three days on the movie, and I went out to Utah. You know. Oh, and, you did uh, go because yeah. that's where they're from. Oh, they, yeah. oh, they live there. You know, I they know. live they're there. They're Mormons. He's, <laughs> yeah, he's a Mormon. Well, you know, I'm sure you've been on a set before. I've never been on a set where I never heard anyone say anything worse than, oh, God, the whole time. Everyone's going, golly, and gee, and no one, and there was White never, bread. there were no four letters, no, it was almost creepy, you know, but he was terribly nice and very, you know, I think very bright, and I, I, I guess I the movie was, didn't do so great, but, you know. I thought it was strange, too, but Napoleon Dynamite really made a name for him. Yeah, And his yeah. wife, Jerusalem. Yeah, very attractive, very, you know, yeah. nice-looking couple yeah. and... N well, nice it crew. Just, it just seems so different from what you've been talking about yeah. off Broadway, and then and I thought we have to talk about that. What kind of character did you play? <laughs> I played uh, I played the publisher. You know, there's uh, uh, there's a there's this uh, sci-fi writer. You know, who's sort of on the on the skids, and and his <laughs> publisher calls him up and says, "You better write a hit book, or you know, oh, we're right. going to stop publishing right, it, basically." Right. So well, that was we had to talk about that because you're still acting. And yeah. you're directing. Oh, yeah. do, you, do you act a lot? Well, I don't act as much as I used to. You know, I used to do a lot it's when lot I was in my, you know, 30s, 40s, early 50s. Um, they're just less parts. Uh -huh. And, you know, the people, you know, the people who are around who, who've lasted as long as I have, they <laughs> tend to be very good. You know, and so the, the, so the competition is always tough. And it's, you know, we all show up, you know, five or six of us will, sh will be called into an audition and we, you know, and we look around knowingly. And, and know. it's kind of, you know, we always think, well, it's kind of arbitrary. You know, what difference does it make whether they take me or right. Alan Miller or whoever it is? Because they're all sort of 
fall into the same category. But, but I've done actually recently. I've done you know I got a, I did an episode of the, the Sopranos before it was over. I you know did a, a really great episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, oh, which is sort of a fun? notorious episode. Was it fun? Yeah, because it was a it was a the, it was about. He's at his shrink, and 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 the, he's complaining that he and his wife have nothing in common. So they, he says, well, why don't you go to the beach? You know, there's a, that's that's not, that's not golf, it's not tennis. You know, it's, what is it? He says, well, I hate the beach. I guess I take to the beach. So the shrink says, there's this great beach that's up north. It's you know, that's never crowded. So he takes his wife to the beach. He's just settling down. He looks up and he sees. Me, his psychiatrist, <laughs> oh, oh. in a speedo thong, <laughs> right? And he's so out. he's so appalled by this that he quits, tries to quit the psychiatrist. But the psychiatrist <laughs> has learned it directly, you know, that he's seen him in the thong. So, you know. so uh, it, was, it became a sort of notorious, funny episode. You so. talked about um, yeah. the English coming in, and you're directing yeah. an Alan Ackborn yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I have no, Yeah, I have a nerve because I've directed nothing but English plays Isn't since that I. Isn't funny? Yeah. Well, I've been I I been directing plays at this theater on La Brea, actually a great little theater. Yeah, called, tell uh, us what that is. Is it is it uh, a, an ensemble cast? No, is it's it a more, company? No, it's not a company. It's a Lost? it's a theater. It's called the Law Studio. Right. It's it's upstairs. It's it's a very <laughs> beautiful theater because actually there was a horrible fire there, a, mm. an arson fire that was set, they think, by a couple of burglars over a weekend and the f and the place was totally destroyed. So when they got the money to renovate it, they did a really Beautiful job. So it's a very comfortable, nice little theater. The studio, Lost Studio, which is because it's very hard to find. <laughs> you know, it's, but it's right on La Brea. It's just that we don't have a neon sign, and it's yeah. And tell us about this play because um, yeah, Act that's Born really why I'm funny. here. Oh, Act One is great. Yeah, I had done nothing but I'd done five Pinner plays, and then last year I did a, a play called uh, Mammals by a woman named oh. Amelia Bullmore, which was actually a big hit. It hadn't been done here. It, I'd seen it in London. Uh, and I started looking around, actually, for an American play to do. Um, and finally, I, but I wanted to work with a lot of the people who I'd worked with in Mammals. It was a great cast. I loved these people. They were really talented, and so, and they also, they also all had great English accents. Some of them were oh, English, oh, uh, and oh, some so. of them weren't. Yeah. Oh, I see. So I started reading Aikborn, and Aikborn is great. I mean, really great. And I guess I was sort of further inspired by seeing the Norman Conquest in New York, which was yes. fantastic. And, you know, and I saw, we saw all three of them in one day, and it was great. And the woman, Amelia Bullmore, who, who wrote Mammals, was in the Norman Conquest. She's also an actress. Oh, she yeah. was. So this play, Confusions, actually was written in, I think, 74, the year after Norman Conquest, it was the next play he oh. wrote after Norman Conquest, and he wrote it because he, you know, he's he's been connected for years with this uh, little theater in Scarborough, where he actually started to write, and he has he's premiered I think seventy three of his seventy four or five at that plays place? at this yeah oh I yeah, didn't know that yeah it's called the Stephen wait a minute hang on a second because I wrote that I, I underlined they took a little. Thing. At the theater that he It's a very, actually, a very experimental, it's called the Stephen Joseph Theater and um, in Scarborough, which is nowhere. But it's apparently a wonderful company. It was the first theater that ever did theater in the round. Uh -huh. And um, uh, so this play was, he wrote this so the, you know, for the company. And um, it's actually five kind of thematically linked one-act plays. Oh, he, he does yeah. a lot of that, yeah. And this is, uh, these, these are, they're really interesting. Some of them, you know, they go from sort of dark comedy to really high farce. I mean, the last play is a play called Gosser's Fet, which is about, you know, this outdoor fair that they hold to raise money for, to raise for a community center. And it's like Murphy's Law, everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong. And so the whole life of the play really takes place 
outside of the of where they are, when which you, is funny. You yeah. have these five plays. Yeah. Do you take an intermission? Yeah. This and is, how long are each one of them? Do you think? Uh, they run. I would say the whole evening with an intermission is maybe a couple of hours. So it's just like a reg, like a regular time in the theater. Yeah, they're just they're they're short. I mean, some of them are fifteen minutes, some are are twenty. Do the, the last one is probably. You know, twenty. Gosh, with Fed is probably twenty-five. Do the same play uh, actors play? In yeah, uh, roles? With the, actually, when they re they originally did the play, they did it with five actors, uh -huh. two women and three men. But I wanted to use a lot of people oh. in the company, so okay. I used four women and three men. And uh, but they all get to play multiple parts, which they love. So they don't get confused. And we're not going to get confused. <laughs> well, I hope I don't get confused. John, I hope that uh, you're not confusing your actors. Thanks no, for no. being with us. No, no, I will. Well, I should tell you when it opens and everything, oh, shouldn't well, I? Oh, well, I think yeah, yeah. we can. We'll find oh, okay. it. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, great. G Good. Thanks. All right, well, thank you. And thanks for okay. watching. Um, email us at jaquinn1 at aol.com, 777. South Figaro, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles.